the Apocryphon starts with John, son of Zebedee, being dejected outside the Jerusalem temple after a Pharisee named Arimenios yells at him and makes fun of him. And so John goes off into a mountain desert, deserted area and has a vision of Jesus. And this is an excerpt from that vision. It says, the heavens opened and the whole creation below the heaven was illuminated with light below heaven. Don't be faint hearted. I am the one who dwells within you always. I am the father. I am the mother. I am the son. And here we see full on the fact that we have a Sethian trinity here. Father, mother, son. Something that I talked about in the Found Christianity series. This has been sometimes called sort of the Gnostic Bible. It, it becomes a, a it becomes a sort of standard text to to talk about the standard Sethian myth. But of course, there's nothing really standard. This just turns out to be the best done, the most grandiose, the most reflected on, and therefore the most famous. The Jews are asking Jesus, "Who are you?" And Jesus later clarifies, "He is Elijah." not just the soul of Elijah. He is Elijah, reborn. Welcome back to the Gnostic and you are about to attain true gnosis. I'm with Dr. M. David Litwa, and today we have a special presentation on the Apocryphon of John, which is one of the Nag Hammadi texts from Egypt. Yep, good to see you, Neil. Good to be back. Um, this is uh, the next installment in the Nag Hammadi series, which I'm putting through on the Patreon. Uh, there's about, there's going to be about 40 episodes, and we're, we're up clocking about half of that so far. Nice. The Apocryphon of John uh, is, is sometimes called the secret book of John because Apocryphon, it just means uh, something hidden or secret. But I'll, I'll go ahead and use Apocryphon and uh, we'll get right into it. Um, Sounds good. So I'd like to start by just an excerpt and to give you a little bit of context, the Apocryphon starts with John, son of Zebedee, being dejected outside the Jerusalem temple after a Pharisee named Arimenios yells at him and makes fun of him. And so John goes off into a mountain desert, deserted area and has a vision of Jesus. And this is an excerpt from that vision. It says, the heavens opened and the whole creation below the heaven was illuminated with light below heaven. And the whole world quaked. I was afraid and I watched and behold, a child appeared to me. Then he changed himself into the form of an old man who had light existing within him. Although I was watching him, I did not understand this wonder. He said to me, John, why are you doubting and fearful? For you are not a stranger to this likeness. Don't be faint hearted. I am the one who dwells within you always. I am the father. I am the mother. I am the son. Unquote. Now, this is uh, Karen King's translation. It's a very, very powerful um, introduction. And here we see full on the fact that we have a Sethian trinity here, father, mother, son, something that I talked about in the Found Christianity series. This is distinctively Sethian Christian doctrine. But what's interesting here is you see, you're seeing overtones from John, that is the Gospel of John, and also from the book of Revelation, where you where in chapter one of Revelation, you see the, the uh, resurrected Christ full of light. But here we see what's called polymorphy. That is the, the Christ, the Godhead, it has three forms and he's sort of, as if he's an unstable wavelength, he sort of wavers in and out of three forms. 
and he manifests all three forms of the Godhead. The fact that he appears as a child is interesting because this is how the Logos appeared to Valentinus, and we have an episode on him on the Patreon. This appearance uh, as a child also appears in the Apocalypse of Paul, which we're going to put on the Patreon next week. So this is very distinctive. Uh, it's an indication that this author is using a what might be called a, a very well-known and recycled meme. But he's using it in a polymorphic aspect. That is, we see the child go to an old man, and then there's a gap in the text, probably uh, the uh, either Christ appears as a woman or some sort of middle-aged man. We don't really know. Let's run through some of the basic data, however, just so you can get a sense for this. So the Apocryphon of John comes in two versions, a long and a short version, and it's in four copies. Three of these copies are found in the Nagamati Codices, that's NHC. One of them is found in the Berlin Codex, which was found in 1896. In the Nagamati Codices, the Apocryphon of John is consistently the first codex, that is, it's the codex written out first, and apparently that means it is the most honored tractate of that codex. And this is really the case, uh, I, I think, that in no other Nagamati text do we have four copies. We have two copies of Eugnostus, two copies of the Gospel of Truth, but never do we have four copies. So whoever was writing this out really wanted to get this into his library multiple times. Um, it's also significant that there's a longer and a shorter version, and the longer version probably comes later and doesn't replace the shorter version. That's also interestingly. Um, and this has been sometimes called sort of the Gnostic Bible. It, it becomes a, a it becomes a sort of standard text to to talk about the standard Sethian myth, but of course there's nothing really standard. This just turns out to be the best done, the most grandiose, the most reflected on, and therefore the most famous. So what this is about is it's actually not distinctly Sethian, and this is the interesting part of the Apocryphon of John. Um, a friend of mine, Thomas Rasmus, wrote a book called Paradise Reconsidered, published in 2005, and showed that there's actually three sets of mythology that are absorbed into the Apocryphon of John. There's native Sethian myth mythology, and we'll talk about that in a second, but there's also Afa theology and what Rosimus calls Barbelloite mythology that's all wrapped up into one. So this is a conglomerate text. It's a true hybrid, and we'll talk about what that might mean for the dating. But let's just outline the shorter version. This will take you, uh, if you've got a copy of the Nagamati scriptures, or a copy of this from Karen King's translation. This will take you about 20 to 30 minutes to read if you're reading slowly. If you're reading fast, this should only take you 15 minutes. So what happens? Well, first there's a frame story of John of Zebedee, son of Zebedee, dejected and encountering the resurrected Jesus on a deserted mountain, as we said. And then in the revelation of Jesus to John, it begins with a discourse on the God above God. That is the God who is so great, he's not even God anymore. He's so far above divinity, unknown. Next, we learn about the Barbello. And the Barbello is that second manifestation of, of God. She's the mother figure. She gives birth to Autogenes, or the self-born, and Autogenes gives rise to the four lights. Now, I'm streamlining this somewhat, but I'm doing this for a purpose because Barbello, Atangenes, and the Four Lights are the three perhaps most consistent figures you'll see in Sethian mythology. So wherever you see these characters, you can think of Sethian mythology. Part three tells the story of wisdom and her abor aborted son, Yaldabaoth. Part four retells the story of paradise where Yaldabaoth and his minions create an earthly Adam, 
made of soul and matter, and then they try to have sex with Eve. In fact, they do so successfully, but only with Eve's shadow. Part five then gets us into salvation history all the way up to Noah's flood. And this is the story of the true spirit fighting against the counterfeit spirit. And finally, after John asks several very important questions, Jesus encourages him, disappears, and John goes off to teach his fellow disciples. This is, an in, this is a secret text, but in a sense, it's a continuation of the Gospel of John. Okay, so the Gospel of John is an, op is an open and public text, and this is a secret text. Mm. But of course, nothing's really secret when published. It's just advertising itself as secret. What are some other major themes? Well, Barbello, if you haven't heard of her, you really should. She is, we don't know what her name means, but she is described as the primal human in this text. Now, the primal human has been known for a long time, uh, since the early second century, in, in what became known as Ophite Christian lore. And I've got an episode on the Ophites on the Patreon. But Barbello herself might have come from another stream of mythology, sometimes called Barbelloite. But the fact that she is portrayed as the primal human shows us that Ophite and Barbelloite thought has been fused by this point. The creator, Yaldabaoth, described as a lion-faced serpent, is definitely evil, not just. So, in other words, this is a key characteristic of Marcionite and Sethian theology, not Valentinian theology, where the creator is just. Fate, the Greek hymarmony, is an evil instrument of the creator because the creator makes the stars and the stars influence human events usually in a negative direction. Souls are punished by transmigration. That's a key teaching. And all souls, however, are saved, except those who consciously reject the truth. So this is a almost universal salvation. I mean, you got to really try hard not to be saved uh, eventually, but you might have to be embodied several times. So what do we think about the dating? Well, here you're going to get a lot of differences among scholars, and I'm going to try to walk you through why I think this is actually a fairly late text. It's well known that Irenaeus, writing about 180 CE, knew a Sethian mythology, which I think was later incorporated into the Apocryphon of John. Now, the reason why I don't think Irenaeus had the Apocryphon of John itself is because he never mentions the frame story about John, which he really should have known, and he's not at all hesitant to tell us about revelations to other disciples like Judas, which he does a little bit later. So he probably doesn't know the frame story, and he, he stops his account right about the birth of Yaldabao, which indicates that he doesn't know any of the story after the birth of Yaldabao. But since the Apocryphon of John is only about a third done when you get to the birth of Yaldabao, Irenaeus just inexplicably would have omitted two thirds of the account. But I don't think there is a good explanation for that. So I, I think Irenaeus has a chunk of what later became the Apocryphon of John, but he didn't have the text itself. The negative theology section, that is the section where God is described as above all characteristics, traits, and, you know, whatever one can think of, overlaps with a definite third century text of the Sethian theology called Allegenes, and that's also in Nagamati Codex, uh, Codex 11. And the fact that there's such an amazing combination, fusion, and hybrid, really, I mean, high, hybrid fusion between Ophite, Sethian, and Barbelloite mythology suggests that this is actually uh, an intellectual magpie bringing together different streams of thought. So, the shorter version of the Apocryphon probably is between 200 and 225, and this is later expanded to a longer version, which might be as late as the uh, 
mid third century. The text isn't mentioned by Plotinus, who knew some of Sethian lore, so hmm. we we don't know. Uh, he probably didn't know it, but that may not be. It's not a smoking gun, obviously. Right. Now about providence, this this is also you know where this text was written is the great mystery because the the seed of Seth or Sethian Christians. We don't know where they are. We, they don't name themselves. They don't seem to have discrete leaders. Uh, we don't know how close their organization was. We don't know how spread out it was. So this is all up for grabs. But I'll just point out a few things. So first of all, transmigration as a teaching is actually very distinctly Alexandrian. The only two theologians that we know who had a robust doctrine of transmigration are Vasilides and Carpocrates. If you're in Rome or Asia Minor or Syria, you tend not to have a doctrine of transmigration. Um, that just uh, seems to be the case. Um, and that is also, a, since this is a Pythagorean trait, this indicates a certain proximity of Alexandrian Christianity and Pythagorean thought. But of course, there are precedents for the theology of Yaldabaoth and, and the angels and creation of Adam by angels in the Syrian theologies of Menander and Saturninus. And if you don't know who these guys are, check out the Patreon, uh, and which I discussed them also in the book uh, Bound Christianities. There's also animal-headed rulers called archons, um, and the, the author has great fun with these. So the, the, the lower creators have animal heads, including the head of a jackass, but also the head of a, a lion for Yaldabaoth. Uh, and a, mm. you have bear and cat-headed <laughs> figures. Um, so it's all fun. Now, of course, everybody knew about that. but um, are, those, if, are those labeled, each one? Yep. Each oh, archon wow. has a different animal head. Yep. Okay, so, so that uh, that at least is reminiscent of Egypt. Again, it's not a smoking gun argument that it was written in Egypt, but take it for what you will. I would lean toward Egypt, but you can't exclude Syria. Now, there's a lot out there in terms of reading, and you know you can find um, uh, on online uh, your your text of the Sacred Book of John or the Apocryphon of John. And I recommend getting the Nagamati scriptures if you haven't, um, if you don't have that as a translation of the of the whole Nagamati library. Um, but there's also um, uh, Karen King has an independent um, translation of the Secret Revelation of John, as she calls it, with a nice uh, set of essays. Um, for a nice scholarly monograph on themes related to this, you can look up Dylan Burns' Apocalypse of an Alien God. Hmm. And for all things Sethian, the, the sort of treasure house of academic lore is John Turner's Sethian Gnosticism. And then I've got a section on the Sethians in the very recent uh, 2021 found Christianities. And the page numbers are are there. So that's, I think, a wrap. Um, and I, <laughs> you know, this text is, is huge. And I really can't emphasize the absolute importance of this text. And for everybody who wants to understand what you may call, you know, what, what we should call Sethian theology, because Gnostic is too broad, right? We should call this Sethian theology. Anyone who wants to understand this should should go to this. But also remember that the first Sethian work that we have, probably mid second century, is the Gospel of Judas. So you may want to stop over in the Gospel of Judas. That's on the Patreon before you tackle the Apocryphon of John. Uh, but that's how it works chronologically. But if you're looking for like the fullest picture of Sethian theology, tackle the Apocryphon of John. I think you'll love it. The author is always correct. Jesus is always correcting Moses and going, you know, it's not how Moses wrote it. Um, and that's a, a fun uh, aspect of the text where you have Jesus actually correcting Moses. But there's all sorts of fun things in this text. And I really encourage comments and questions. 
And everybody who joins the Patreon uh, gets to comment. And of course, you join a certain tier. You can always ask me questions. I welcome that anytime. So I'll shut up now. And uh, Neil, if you have any issues uh, or questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah. My question is towards what makes something Sethian and how far back does the Sethian tradition go? Yeah, good question. So like I mentioned, so Gospel of Judas is our earliest instance of, of Sethian mythology. Okay. And when you read the Gospel of Judas, the mythological section is in the back and it reads very choppy. Um, not just because it's fragmentary, it, it actually is a bit choppy. And when you turn over to the Apocryphon of John, it's, it's very grandiose, refined. It looks like they've thought about this a lot more. Mm. The characters are better defined and, and rounded out. And it just is a lot fuller. Okay. Yeah. But the tradition, this, the Sethian Christian tradition, and it, and it is, I should emphasize, it's, it's definitely a Christian tradition. Okay. Obviously. Um, you know, you've got apostles, you've got Jesus talking, you know, the Barbello, yes, is a mother goddess, but she's also wisdom, which is familiar with from other um, Christian parties. So, yes, about about mid-second century, we've got Sethian theology, and then that develops all the way past Plotinus. Plotinus encounters Sethians about 250. And then Epiphanius tells us about a whole variety of different uh, parties in Egypt and Syria, which also seem to have been spin-offs from Sethian mythology. So if not the group, then at least the mythology survives into the fourth century and beyond. Interesting. Um, the John, the character John, who's the author, the who, who, supposedly the author, do you see any resemblance of the other John from the gospel at all or, or no? What about the revelation, John? Well, Christians, early Christians, yeah, weren't that great at distinguishing the Johns. Right. Um, <laughs> so now this, the one in the Apocrypha is John, son of, son of Zebedee, and he's usually the, the one said to be the beloved disciple. What's interesting about the fact that John is the medium of revelation is, you know, when you turn over to the gospel of Judas, it looks like this particular Sethian writer just hates the apostles um, and uh, is anti-apostolic. But that's not really the case, actually. That's a bit beguiling because when you turn over to the Apocryphon of John, we have the apostle highly exalt exalted, at least one of them. And even in the Gospel of Judas, I mean, Judas is technically an, an apostle uh, as well. And he, you know, he's not heroic, but he does get a secret revelation just like John does. So I would say overall, the Sethian Christian movement, it isn't anti-apostolic in itself. Um, they're using traditional Christian authorities and they're just using them in different way. It's sort of like the Gnostic Peter and the Gnostic James, which I talk right, about right. on Patreon. There's different versions of the apostles. And since their characters are sort of like ciphers, actually there's very little historical memory attached to any of them. Most, if not all of it is later legend, then you can form the character however you want. Hmm. Interesting. Um... The last thing I wanted to ask you is about oh, was an echo for a second is about the um the the transmigration thing. And I thought about this in the in the gospels where it talks about um John the Baptist being Elijah. Would that be a, do you think that's sort of an example of the gospels have like like for, I don't know how to frame this but like the people who who use transmigration in their theology don't you think they can sort of point to that and say, see, look, even the Gospels say transmigration is a, is a thing. So we're not, this isn't really heretical. Would you, what, what do you think about that? Absolutely. These are early Christians. They don't advertise themselves as Pythagoreans. Right. Um, so they may be fusing Neo-Pythagorean lore 
just as today, you know, I might fuse my own existentialist philosophy with my Christianity, but I'm not going to call it existentialist philosophy anymore. I'm just going to call it Christian theology. So these, this is what these guys were doing. Carper Creations definitely, uh, it seems, uh, appealed to that text in John uh, where the Jews are asking Jesus, who are you? And Jesus later clarifies, he is Elijah, not just the soul of Elijah. He is Elijah, right. reborn. Um, so definitely, um, they also appeal to Paul, where Paul says that, you know, I once lived my life apart from law, uh, which is in Romans. And since he was a Jew, there was never a time he lived apart from law. So he must be referring to previous existence. Uh, that's Vasilides. But that's the kind of inferential logic that these guys use. Uh, you know, it, it isn't, you know, the orthodox interpretation. People have been, I won't say brainwashed, but we've been certainly trained to read the Bible. Whether you hate the Bible or you love it, you've been, you've been trained by a tradition to read it in a certain way. Right. And what's fun about these guys is they train you not to read it in that standard way. So this is why this material is so important. Wake absolutely. up. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I, I think that's the whole point of Christianity was to sort of look at the way things are and okay, we're going to interpret the law this way now. And we're going to, you know, so I think there's definitely some valid, valid things going on there with these unorthodox Christians, as you, as people would call them. But yeah, that's it. For yeah. Me. They, I mean, they are who they are. The unorthodox would be anachronistic, but they are, I, I will just call them alternative. Right. You know, just like there's many alternative Christians today. Um, some of them, you know, smoke weed and God knows what else. I mean, and, and that's fine or, or, you know, it, but every, every, uh, party is different. Um, and every theology is different. And one theology doesn't have the right to say, I'm the one true theology. No, it, you have to determine what seems right in dialogue. And the dialogue has always been going on. So don't be fooled. Yeah. Oh, and this, this, this just popped in my head too. The, um, the animal heads thing when you, later on, when you start seeing like art artwork, when they're depicting the four evangelists, you know, you, Mark's identified with the lion, John's identified with the eagle. Do you think there's anything going on with that? Or that's just a completely separate thing? That's a good question. So that's that's later tradition. Yeah. Um, really getting into like third and fourth century. Right. Right. Um, and the th the difference there is that it doesn't appear to be animal heads. That's true. Um, it, it's just entire animals. Um, and and the they're keyed to the four animals surrounding the throne in, in Revelation. Revelation five, I think. Uh, but they're not human bodies with animal heads. That's distinctly Egyptian. True, that's true. But yeah, that's that's uh, that's it. That's all I got. And then, like I always say, you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The demiurge has no power over you. Jesus.